Our next speaker, Dr. Molitaris, Bruce Molitaris, is professor of medicine and director of nephrology and the Indiana Center for Biological Microscopy at Indiana University School of, of Medicine. He's an expert on acute kidney injury and the utilization of two-photon microscopy to study in vivo cellular and subcellular processes within the kidney. But he is also a counselor at ASN, and he's recognized that the larger picture here of building the workforce is, is crucial to uh, the future of nephrology, the, the nephrology that we all have. So Bruce, please. So thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here and to follow a, a great presentation by Joe, uh, kind of setting the stage for what I will present to you, which I can't be very positive about, except that we have a major challenge uh, to move forward with. So my goals are to highlight the crisis in the workforce. Uh, this is physician workforce. Indicate why the supply of nephrologists is decreasing, especially US trained nephrologists. Describe the ASN approach and to speculate on what's needed in the future. So by the year 2020, there'll be 775,000 patients with end-stage renal disease. There's a 25% increase in prevalent ESRD in patients over 65 years of age. The average starting age for a patient on dialysis is 67 years old. 10,000 baby boomers will turn 65 every day. Over 500,000 patients will be on Chronic renal replacement therapy, there are 330,000 today, and well over 30 million patients will have CKD. So the demand is going no place but up. Um, in addition, the Affordable Care Act will increase physician demand. Uh, 32 million previously uninsured will need additional care. We know that many of these patients are going to come from lower socioeconomic um, disadvantaged situations where the hypertension, diabetes, and CKD is rampant. Estimates indicate greater than 91,000 new physicians will be needed just for this need alone. So let's look at the change in chronic kidney disease in the U.S. adult population. This is, does not include pediatrics, so 18 years and above. Between the years, these four years here and these four years here. And you can see stage one, and I'm assuming that most of you in the audience know the staging classification, which is um, basically minor loss of kidney function, has increased slightly. Stage two, uh, somewhat more. Stage three, which is a real jumping off ground and a point at which the kidney starts to progress down a uh, pathway toward end stage disease, has increased. Stage four, uh, the patients either make it through this stage and end up on dialysis, uh, or they die of cardiovascular disease primarily at that time. But the important component here is that we've gone in a very short period of time from 10% to 13.5%, and with the obesity epidemic, hypertension, and diabetes, uh, this is only going to continue to increase. Also, our patients are living longer on dialysis as a testament to good care. This is just the um, Accountable Care Act showing the demand, showing the present supply, and showing the need for an additional 91,000 physicians. Many of these physicians, as Dr. Bonaventure indicated, will be primary care. Um, but nephrology needs to be leading the pack in the care, the primary care of patients with chronic kidney disease, and I also believe hypertension. So we need to produce more fellows. This is the needed number of new nephrologists as projected based on those current estimates of 436. This is how many we certify each year. That's not a good number. So we're falling behind. We're not catching up. Fewer U.S. medical graduates are interested in nephrology these days. So this is the increase in the number of uh, available nephrology training programs in the United States from 2002 to 2009, okay? 401 to 711, 365 to 900. So fellowships have gone up from 711 to 911, and U.S. medical graduates now occupy a smaller number of that. 
Now do the math here. 365 out of all of our training slots, 911 come from U.S. medical graduates. 42%. Okay. Where do the rest come from? So let's look at um, just the U.S. medical graduates for a minute. And this is between 2002 and 2009, the previous statistics. And let's break it down to increase and decrease in U.S. medical graduates by disciplines. Well, cardiovascular disease is attracting more. Endocrinology, gastroenterology, hematology, infectious disease, pulmonary critical care, rheumatology. Oh, wait, there's two that are going down, geriatrics, and they reduced their number of slots available. We increased ours by 200, and we went down by 36. Okay. Students are not going into nephrology. There's also a, a lack of gender diversity in nephrology compared to others, except for, again, geriatric medicine. So I, I just, we've been doing a little bit of exploring, and we're going to do more and hopefully publish this as an editorial, but this is the Indiana experience. And I want you to think about medical students now going into medical school. So we're the second largest medical school in the country, 280 medical students per class. Half of those students go out into the periphery of nine training sites for the first two years, and then they're brought back to the mothership for their clinical years. They experience nephrology in the first year physiology class, and it's taught primarily by PhDs in physiology. And I can tell you at our institution, I was just disallowed from teaching nephrology during that class, during that freshman year, because the physiology department would lose money because I was teaching the class uh, and it would go to the Department of Medicine. And I said, I, I don't care, I'll give the money back. And my department said, well, we'll do the same. But uh, they have locked out all MDs from teaching in that class throughout the whole year. The second year, pathophysiology is taught by MDs. I think we get eight lectures during the whole year and we get three sessions of uh, three hours with them and that's it for the year. So. Now you're a second year medical student, you've been exposed to these two areas of nephrology for a very limited time. You do your fourth year, third year you don't have electives, fourth year you have electives. 10 out of 280 select to do a fourth year elective in nephrology, 10 students. Less than 100 of our 280 class go into primary care fields of medicine, pediatric, family medicine. This is important because if they go into one of these fields, they will be exposed to nephrologists and nephrology, and they will learn about electrolytes, acid base, acute kidney injury. So I'm not worried about those. But the vast majority, 200 of these, go into surgery, OBGYN, et cetera, et cetera. They're not exposed to nephrologists, they've had no formal training in nephrology, and they enter the workforce as physicians I think, not understanding fluid, volume, acid base, electrolytes, acute kidney injury, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, ESRD. Hospitalists, there's no requirement for a resident to do nephrology. Many of your hospitalists have never been trained in nephrology, okay? Think about that. Uh, this is just those 10 students that hasn't changed. So, so then I looked at residents, and so let's take the residents doing a nephrology rotation. And you can see here, it's about 70, um, up into the 80s here in 2010. And then we did what many people are doing. We did away with our nephrology ward service, okay? This was a service where we had two interns and one resident. Every month we had a nephrologist and they got exposure. We did away with it for a number of reasons. And now those patients are admitted to hospitalists and those residents do consult. We think we give a, a, a better view of nephrology by doing that, and we're actually doing this to try and increase the number of people interested. But if the exposure to nephrology has gone down, again, and you'll see why that's important. So why do U.S. medical students not want to go into nephrology? Well, we do know from surveys done um, by Mark Parker and the, the uh, training program directors that the first interest in nephrology occurs primarily during medical school, okay? Now look at prior, too. They don't know what nephrology is when they come to medical school. I didn't when I went to medical school, okay? Um, so they learn about it in medical school, and the vast 40% become interested there during residency year number one and after residency year number one. So this is where we have to capture those students. We don't capture them 
here. We need to start in medical school or before medical school, and your, your public um, policy looking at this awareness is really important. So then you talk to physicians in training are negative about nephrology, and these are residents. For many residents, nephrology patients are misery personified. <laughs> so what patients do they see in the hospital? They see the frequent flyer, non-compliant dialysis patients who come in with 15 medical problems on 25 medications, and why in the world would they want to go into that for a career? Okay? Many of us that trained in the 70s, we didn't have large dialysis units associated with academic med training programs. We didn't know what a dialysis patient was. We were excited about the other aspects of nephrology. Okay? We have to excite these students. I'm on the second renal month, and the days can be long and very stressful. I'm having second thoughts about renal myself. If you are in it for the money, which ultimately determines how competitive a subspecialty is, believe it or not, forget nephrology. The assistant professor in nephrology said, by 2016, expect drastic changes in funding for dialysis and therefore your income. They are frightened. More than three out of four students, these are medical students, said renal pathophysiology courses are too complex, fail to stimulate interest, lack relevance, so volume status, electrolytes, acid base, acute kidney injury, they're not relevant, okay? <laughs> One quarter said they're just right. Well, what's the public think about nephrology? Well, first of all, I have to tell you that when you go to Capitol Hill, you have to tell some of the staffers what nephrology is because they don't know, okay? They know what kidney disease is, but they don't know what renal or what nephrology is. That's why we renamed it acute kidney injury rather than acute renal failure, okay? Uh, I don't know how many of you saw this ProPublica um, thing last fall. Unfortunately, much of what they reported is very true. And it is a major problem that we have to deal with as a discipline, a society, and so forth. Reimbursement issues, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I'm just going to say that 28% of nephrologist time is spent in caring for dialysis patients. The average nephrologist now has 70 dialysis patients, twice as many in the 1990s. There's decreasing capitated payment per patient over time. The income from dialysis, though, far exceeds the percentage of time spent. So there is this incentive draw of the nephrologist out of the CKD clinic, out of the hospital, and onto the highways going dialysis unit to dialysis unit. The financial incentive pulls nephrology care away from CKD patients. So we're the very people that can do research and try and minimize the progression to ESRD, and we're ignoring those patients until it's too late and we're seeing them late stage and then in dialysis, and we make more money doing that. Now, that's not right. The result minimizes time with residents in the hospital, leaves it up to hospitalists who may have not have been trained well in nephrology. How can they interest somebody if they don't have the passion and the training in an area to go into it? Perception of nephrology is a traveling dialysis provider. Recent survey results. So, so we're training fewer nephrologists, and how are they trained? How good do they feel about their training? One in three and one in five fellow graduates do not feel competent to deliver in-center hemodialysis care when they graduate. So we not only have less fellows, they don't feel competent. 40% are not competent in peritoneal dialysis, and 80% are not ready for home hemodialysis. Now this is a new surge. I think it's gonna be a very popular surge. They're just a little frightened by it. Um, but this is something we have to worry about. So, we have real problems. Now, are we the first people to come up with this? No. The Australians did this in 2009, now two years ago. Nephrology, especially in need of resuscitation, published in our journal, or one of our journals. Um, major, and this was their findings, major categories for excluding nephrology a career. Issues surrounding dialysis. Dependency on other providers, vascular surgeons. Topic found unappealing. Perceived lack of appreciation from staff and patients. Poor remuneration. Workload. Training demands and issues. Lack of research support compared to other subspecialties. Same thing that we've identified through surveys. Now, if you go to our fellows who are new out in the field and you ask, so they're not fellows anymore, they're actually doing uh, the job, they've graduated, what do they think of their career? 
Well, 74% said they were very satisfied and 20% said they were satisfied. So 94% are satisfied. So when they get there, they're happy. Okay? But we've got to get them there, and that's the problem. Are they paid well? Well, you, you know, it's reasonable, I think. Here's nephrology in the pay scale. We're above pulmonary. We're above many of the other areas that we compete with. Um, so I, I don't think that that's an issue. Now, we have been blessed with international medical graduates, which make up that 58%. Remember I told you 42% of the slots are filled by U.S. grads. 58% are now filled by international medical graduates. And they are top-notch, risk-taking physicians who come to this country. And we've been blessed. But now there's issues with J-1 visas, okay, coming out of Washington. And the number of international medical graduates in this 12-year period has dropped from 11,400 to 6,500. And so our major stopgap fill for our residents or fellowship programs is dwindling. So um, it's not real positive out there. Well, let's look at some of the reasons that, some of the areas we think we can improve. And Joe showed this slide. This is total NIH funding by research disease-related areas, five years, cancer, AIDS, heart disease, diabetes, kidney disease. Okay, it's very low. Now, if you look at the cost burden to the federal government of kidney disease, it's huge. And if you then look at the percent of total NIH funding allocated to NIDDK over that 10-year period, you can see that it's not increasing, it's not level, it's decreasing. So, really quickly, I want to go summarize what the ASN's thinking about doing. So we've developed um, as a charge of the ASN task force. We developed a task force to look at ways to increase interest in nephrology. Um, we've uh, include recommendations that increase interest among underrepresented minorities and women, and we attempt to identify potential revenue sources that can help us meet these uh, aspirations. Um, these are the people who run the task force. Sharon Silberger is in the audience, and Sharon is going to co-chair the um, workforce committee that will come out of the task force uh, recommendations, and it's really a pleasure to have her on that committee. First was to hold a summit at the Nephrology ASN meeting this year, and it was amazed that when you present these data to everybody in the audience, the light goes off because they're all the program training directors and heads of divisions, and the light went off, and people are, are excited about doing something. There's an editorial, which is now in press, detailing some of the data that I've shown you. There's a commentary providing recommendations to address this. It's on our website. You can see that. There's use of um, nephrology workforce. Uh, oh, we have to notify policymakers and let them know that we have a major problems and that it is in U.S. medical graduate schools. Um, as Dr. Bonaventure said, he was just at World Kidney Day last week uh, on Capitol Hill. The ASN has decided to have its own kind of kidney day on Capitol Hill. Uh, comes at a little bit better time of year with reaching the uh, representatives and will be there in a month. And then we have ongoing interactions with NIH, especially NIDDK. And NIDDK, which is the Diabetes and Kidney Institute, is very interested in this workforce issue. And Rob Starr, in particular, has made this a high level issue for himself. We're going to get modern, as Joe mentioned, and we're going to have uh, social media type ways that we can reach these students and residents. Um, we'll produce an annual report to the ASN leadership on the State of Nephrology Fellowship, particularly the number of U.S. graduates that are going into it, and we want to see something improved. And we're going to, many of us are thinking about restructuring our rotations to develop creative rotations for medical students that focus on key areas acute kidney injury and critical care nephrology, chronic kidney disease, and let them see patients in the outpatient clinic who are doing well and enjoying their care and not progressing on. Interventional nephrology. Transplantation is a major area that we do not emphasize to our students enough. So we have to increase, improve, and emphasize mentoring also and increase exposure to our nephrologists. Um, so to implement strategies for increasing interest in nephrology among fellows, um, and residents, medical students, undergraduates, we've come up with these approaches. 
Okay, and you'll be hearing much more about this because this is going to be a major issue within the ASN. We've created a committee, um, an advisory group, and we will be moving forward on that. Uh, we've designated ASN members to serve as a chair and Sharon, I says, as a co-chair for interesting interest in nephrology careers. And we've made these chairs a member of the ASN Board of Advisors so that they can be at the table uh, and not on the menu. Uh, I really like that this morning. Uh, and this is uh, Todd Ibrahim's little uh, thing. Increase awareness, notify policymakers, think differently, examine workforce, restructure rotations, enhance education, strengthen leadership, and tell me what you think. Uh, summary, the interest, i.e. supply in nephrology is decreasing. There is a rapid growing increase, i.e. demand in CKD and ESRD populations. Fellows are leaving trading programs ill-prepared, no, I, I don't know of any, and I'm hoping that I hear later. I don't know of accredited programs or standards for nurse practitioners, uh, advanced practice nurses, and uh, physician assistants in nephrology. And um, we really have to make use of this team approach as we move forward. So, final slide. There will be a shortage of nephrologists, inevitable. The effort of nephrologists will follow the money. I think inappropriately that's going to dialysis now. In hospital care by nephrologists will decrease. There is not a group of physicians that, or I should say, is there a group of physicians that can assume this role? Certainly they won't be mentoring people to become nephrologists. CKD patient care will continue to occur late in the course rather than early. Additional healthcare professionals are needed to meet the growing need uh, and welcomed, I must admit, uh, and a team approach in nephrology care is there, but I think we need to emphasize and reorder some of the team players so that we can really move forward in the future. Thank you very much.